You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. It consists of a series of presentations by experts in allergy immunology and can serve as the didactic curriculum for trainees in the field. I hope you enjoy COLA. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Conferences Online and Allergy coming to you from Kansas City today. Um, it is August 19th. Uh, our first uh, speaker today is Dr. Galen Marshall, um, who's going to speak on allergy and asthma in elderly patients. Um, Dr. Marshall um, is Professor of Medicine, Pediatrics, Pathology, and Population Health Sciences, as well as Division Director of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Um, and he is the recent past editor-in-chief uh, of the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Um, we spoke with uh, Mitchell Grayson just a week and a half or so ago, who's the new editor. So. Um, anyway, congratulations on moving on from that position. Um, appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, after 16 years of getting up every morning to see what came in the night before, uh, it's been a wonderful uh, a change not to do that every day. And Mitch and his team have taken over the annals and they're, they've already taken it to heights that uh, I only dreamed about. So I'm delighted. I'm also delighted for the opportunity to talk about people in my age category. I now consider myself a vintage faculty member. Uh, some people use the word mature. Other people that are less nice just say old. But uh, what I want to take you through in uh, the next little while is some information that many of you already know, and it some of you may be learning something new, but the idea is to put it together because this old story that's been going around, is it 70s, the new 60, and 50s, the new 40? It really is true, particularly in elderly people. There are more functional, but there are still real significant things to consider when you're going to help in their management of their allergic and asthmatic disease. So these are my disclosures, research support. Uh, I'm a member of PDAC. Uh, uh, what we're gonna do is describe similarities and differences and discuss unique challenges of diagnosis and management of allergy and asthma in elderly patients. The basic facts, of course, just by way of review, we all know, all true allergy, at least the way we're describing this, is the IgE-mediated type one hypersensitivity reaction that involves mast cell activation and uh, so-called late phase or inflammatory response. Uh, true in essentially and described in essentially all types of allergic disease. Clinical manifestation depends on the organs that are affected. There are very common uh, multi-organ uh, inducers, food, drug, and, and anaphylaxis of uh, spontaneous or identified. Therapeutic approach is still avoidance, doesn't go away with age. Medical history, uh, interestingly enough is a careful history you'll tend to see in older individuals about decreased uh, response of uh, allergic uh, mediator uh, blockers if you will and this may be because of decreased sensitivity to the mediators themselves and then immunotherapy with decreased sensitivity to allergens we'll talk about whether that's something that we would even consider uh, if we're all good allergy doctors in the allergic patient. Special considerations, again, there's more varied exposure in the environment, dietary changes, polypharmacy in uh, as we age, immune senescence, the underlying senescence of the immune response, we'll comment about that in just a moment. Its greatest impact, remember, is on new antigens and immune regulation, not so much on immune memory. And then secondary immunosuppression from the comorbid, uh, comorbid I'll say it right in a minute, the comorbidity of the disease itself or drugs that may be used uh, uh, that have a secondary immunosuppressive effect. Clinical manifestations, there are oftentimes non-allergic comorbidities that can mask or alter the presentation, may be uh, organ specific or may be more generalized, and then drug-drug interactions may be more complicated 
in older individuals uh, than they are in uh, younger populations. The therapeutic approach as a result is a careful uh, attention to phenotyping of the specific clinical entity and recognizing overlap. And that's particularly true in some of the pulmonary things, but we'll talk about that as well in nasal uh, conditions in just a second. And the issues related to drug intolerance. Uh, we very often cannot be, and not to suggest that we are being glib when we do um, prescriptions and make therapeutic decisions, but let's face it, on a busy clinic, lots of people coming through, lots to see, limited amount of time to spend with a patient. We all fall into a group. This is the diagnosis. This is the main therapy. And we fall into that group with regularly. It's something we all do. It's not to suggest it's bad or it's bad medicine. But what happens is that it, when a patient is older, very often we need to be more thoughtful about this because of the recognition of drug intolerance and adverse drug-drug interactions. Major pathophysiology differences, immunologically, there are differences that as we begin to age that are related to this immune senescence that manifests. CD3 tends to go down, and these are proportionate numbers, not necessarily absolute numbers, though in large instances, it's also absolute, but CD3 goes down. The CD4, CD8 ratio goes down, not only because of a decrease in CD4, but because of a relative increase in CD8. It will move down that way. Remember the CD45 RA and RO markers. The RO is the memory marker. The RA is the new, uh, a new or naive marker. We tend to lose naive lymphocytes and maintain, relatively speaking, they increase, but we maintain uh, the memory response. The CD19 B cells decrease with age, and interestingly, the CD1656 positive in K cells increase with age, and the data suggests to this that it's not only percentages in the peripheral blood, it's also absolute numbers. Cytokine profiles, uh, IL-2, IL-10, TGF-beta tends to wane, uh, but IL-4, 6, interleukin-1, uh, beta in particular, uh, receptor antagonists, TNF-alpha, IL-12 and IL-15, remembering an IL-15 is a particular cytokine that supports natural killer cells. So that increases, which may be an explanation for the increase, uh, or at least partial explanation of the increase in NK cells we see with age. Immune globulins tend to increase IgG1 through 3, but not 4. And remember some of your uh, reference labs that you use, zero is a uh, acceptable level for IgG4. So low numbers are there. IgA increases, IgM stays stable, and IgE tends to decrease. Some people believe that the increases that are seen here may be at least in part accounted for by the fact that the osmolarity of uh, plasma in older individuals tends to be higher, which reflects a state of relative dehydration uh, old people drink too much, they have to go to the bathroom too much, so they learn to be thirstier or at least reorient where they're relatively uh, dehydrated. So it raises the question whether the IgG as a function is really increasing in production or whether at least part of that is because of uh, uh, the change in uh, the relative volume. So it becomes a concentration thing, not an absolute value thing. Uh, there are certain environmental influences that are important. Uh, we know about global temperatures that are increasing. Global warming occurs. The argument, the political and philosophical arguments is why it's occurring, because we're driving and flying our private jets too much or driving too much, or it's the natural cycle of the Earth itself or some combination of that. But few people can objectively argue that we have higher temperature norms now than we have in uh, certainly in the last uh, 100 years or so. These increased temperatures are associated with increased petrochemical pollution levels, ozone, the PMs, particularly 2.5 other reactive oxygen species. Our sensitivity to these increases with age and they have well-defined adverse, not necessarily asthma or allergic, but well, uh, well-documented adverse impact on organs, cardiovascular, pulmonary, 
mucosal tissue as well as, again, increasing plasma viscosity, which goes back and speaks to the comment I made about immune globulins just a moment ago. It's also associated with heightened and prolonged pollen seasons in temperate climates. And as I'll comment on it in just a moment, the old idea that old people are not allergic anymore is uh, rapidly being replaced with the understanding that while their allergic sensitization may not be as significant or severe on a population basis as it is in younger individuals, uh, I know if you see older patients in your practice, I suspect you see, as I do, there are those who still have significant allergic disease. I'm in my early 70s, and I still uh, have to make sure I'm well medicated for the fall allergy season in particular because of my persistent sensitivity uh, to ragweed pollen. Internal environments, housing of elderly use are oftentimes not as, and I put this word in quotes, clean, particularly if they're in an institutional setting, but also their increased levels of house dust mites, cockroaches, rodents, and pet dander. Uh, people are more likely to have cats, indoor cats and dogs as they get older as companions. And all of these are indicated that not that somebody doesn't sweep their floor, but that these are increased levels that have been described in the literature in households of older individuals compared to younger. The clinical spectrum of allergy uh, allergic eye disease, the most common uh, in elderly is allergic keratoconjunctivitis, and it rarely presents with other atopic conditions such as AD, rhinitis, or asthma, but the major differential, and this is an important one, I don't know about you, but I have never put steroid drops in anybody's eyes. I'm not good enough with the slit lamp exam, and I saw as a fellow the, F, the effect of um, putting steroid drops in the eyes of someone that they thought had allergic conjunctivitis and in fact had herpetic keratoconjunctivitis and didn't have corneas the next day. Uh, the differential here is senile keratoconjunctivitis, a bacterial infection or a viral infection. And essentially, if they're not responding uh, as you would hope they would to the standards, the, uh, the uh, standard allergic eye drops that we use, ophthalmology consultation becomes very appropriate. Rhinitis, the history, is the key for suspicion for atopic component. If this is someone who's got classic vasomotor rhinitis, every time they eat, their nose runs, they're stopped up at night, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that's different than these symptoms vary if I sweep the floor, if I go to my granddaughter's home who's got two cats in the house, uh, in the spring and the fall, et cetera. The history is even more key. I mean, allergists do the great best job of any doctors. I say that totally objectively, of course. We do the best job or certainly as good a job as any other clinician in taking an excellent history. But it's even more important in our elderly individuals if we're going to go down the pathway of an allergic workup. Allergy skin testing or in vitro testing, immunocap being about 95% as sensitive as skin testing is often indicated. Remember that skin test response decrease with aging. So at times it may be more appropriate to go down the in vitro route to rule out allergy in these individuals rather than the allergy skin testing. There might be people on the call and around that would argue a little bit with that, but I think most of us that take care of a number of older patients would tend to agree that in vitro testing is certainly as uh, a useful, if not more useful than skin testing in these folks. The major differential in rhinitis, of course, is chronic non-allergic non rhinitis, vasomotor, or interestingly, it's important to remember rhinitis medicamentosum, not necessarily just from the fact that they use Afrin too much, but it may be other medications that have impact on the nasal mucosa and then the potential for rebound uh, congestion. Allergic skin diseases, contact dermatitis to chemicals, fragrances, uh, balsam of Peru containing things, which is a big one in older individuals because their fragrances, their components of fragrances are components of certain kinds of foods, heavy metals like the nickels. These are all uh, still very common causes of contact dermatitis in the older individuals. Atopic dermatitis is significantly less common, but certainly should be considered in new onset eczema. 
and high in that differential, the dermatologists tell me is psoriasis. But if they've started to do something new, they've got a new dietary consideration, there's a new medication on board, and they have a new con onset of eczema, AD is something to consider. Uncommon rashes, they can certainly have drug rash. Uh, the workup for scabies, we see a lot more in older populations, particularly in institutionalized populations, but they oftentimes come in with very severe uh, rashes and are looking for relief from us. Clinical spectrum in chronic urticaria, it's less associated angioedema in older individuals, and there are actually fewer urticaria lesions, but they may be equally miserable in the pruritus that they experience. Spontaneous as opposed to physical or cholinergic is the most common. Infectious is more common in elderly. There's an association with H. pylori and with uh, Anasacus uh, simplex. Uh, about almost half are associated with an autoimmune phenomenon, so it's a higher percentage of the anti-IgE receptor. There's a discussion, and I think many of us know this discussion of, well, is it associated with antithyroid antibodies? Hypothyroidism is more common in the elderly. I, in my looking in the literature, I could not find studies that presented any data that was convincing that someone that had uh, uh, just hypothyroidism, whether it was Hashimoto's related or whatever, uh, that they were more likely to have an autoimmune component to their urticaria. Uh, aspirin inset sensitivity is greater in the elderly. Uh, the use is greater in the elderly, but the sensitivity is as well. And new onset chronic urticaria in elderly is uh, oftentimes associated with monoclonal gammopathy, so much so that at least in our practice, if I've got someone over 60 that shows up with new onset chronic urticaria, uh, I'll get an SPEP just to make sure we're not dealing with a monoclonal gammopathy. Not everyone will do that, but I do, and I think it's a good thing to do. And my experience is that I've not had problems with their insurance paying for it when we write in the note, the association, and that we're just looking for it to rule it out. Angioedema, new onset hereditary angioedema is exceedingly rare. It's uh, If they have an inhibitor deficiency, it's almost certainly acquired, even with a di distant family history. But if they don't show up with one until they're in their mid-60s, you need to make sure that they've had a good neoplasm and uh, uh, collagen vascular workup uh, to make sure that that's not a secondary impact of these other illnesses. And there's a higher rate of angioedema in patients taking ACE inhibitors. You know, there's the characteristic tongue edema or facial edema, but you can have other forms of edema as well. So much so that someone that's taking uh, the uh, standard ACE inhibitors, the lisinoprils, uh, et cetera, that uh, at least in our practice, and I think in many other practices, uh, the first thing they'll do is take them off the ACE inhibitor, whether they can then go to an ARB and decide whether there's cross reactivity or not is a different discussion. And again, in looking at the literature, there is not a aging component to that to say that if there's someone taking ACE and they swell and you take them off that you would, and they're over 65, that you would not put them on an ARB if you take a 45 year old and put them on an ARB. I could not find any information in the literature that says you should be less likely to do that because of their age. And then anaphylaxis itself, there's no specific increase in incidence with age that's been reported, although it is more likely to be either idiopathic or hymenoptera related, uh, and food anaphylaxis is distinctly unusual. However, if they do have anaphylaxis, the morbidity and mortality is considerably higher in the elderly population. The comorbidities of cardiovascular or pulmonary and the concomitant medications either polypharmacy itself or specifically the use of NSAIDs, beta blockers, and for many individuals, the um, uh, uh, ACE inhibitors as well. Food allergy incidence is increasing worldwide and appears to occur in the elderly as well, up to 5%. Consider maintaining existing food allergy into later, later life versus new onset. The new onset is far less common in the elderly, even compared to individuals in midlife, uh, compared to someone who's had a long-standing allergy 
to food to a specific food that continues into later life. Most common presentation is GI, but anaphylaxis to foods is much less common in the elderly population. Drug allergy, the, the uh, ADRs are more common, but drug allergy is actually less common in the elderly compared to the young, but drug allergy in elderly is up to a 10% mortality risk. So if you identify it, it's a pretty important thing to do as modifying their exposure to the drug to which they're allergic. It's estimated that the ADRs account for much as 10% of geriatric hospitalization, risk factor for the allergy being female, frail in health, uh, multiple comorbidities in the use of polypharmacies. The culprit drugs are not substantially different from the younger population. So there's not a specific old person anaphylax drug anaphylaxis drug. Uh, efficacy of therapeutics in the elderly and histamines have decreased effectiveness. Now, remember effectiveness and efficacy. Effectiveness is does it work? Efficacy is can it work? The biggest issue is the danger, absolute danger. And if it were in my power, I would make it a federal law illegal to administer diphenhydramine to anyone over the age of 60. Needless to say, it's not in my purview, so I can't do that. But we counsel our patients very regularly and very specifically about the use of first generation antihistamines because of their side effects, not only they're decreased, so they tend to take a higher dose, but also the other components it has, the anticholinergic effects, which in an older gentleman can be substantial, uh, the, the uh, other types of effects that can increase comorbidities. Corticosteroids is still the mainstay of controlling inflammation, topicals still work, Catecholamines continue to work for uh, uh, support, uh, albeit with decreased efficacy. Side effects often related to comorbid endosopafunction, as we mentioned, the anticholinergic and soporific effects mentioned in antihistamines, and the corticosteroids impact on bone density, diabetes, weight gain, skin thinning, glaucoma, and cataracts. These are all systemic corticosteroids effect, and perhaps and in higher doses, inhaled corticosteroids in uh, asthma patients, but these are not from nasal and topical. No good data to support that in elderly or even in younger individuals. Polypharmacy, of course, is an issue. Psychosocial memory impairment for therapeutic adherence, sometimes particularly if it's multiple times a day or if it's uh, a strained schedule, you're going to take it Monday through Thursday and not take it Friday, Saturday and Sunday. That becomes a real problem for people as they get older. Affordability of medications with fixed incomes. Very oftentimes patients, uh, older patients in particular, they're just embarrassed to tell you, doctor, I can't afford that medicine. So they just don't get it filled or they don't use it or they'll stretch it out if it's supposed to be used every day. They'll try to see if they can get away with using it every third to fourth day to stretch the uh, uh, medication because of affordability issues. Anxiety and depression affecting symptom perception and therapeutic motivation. If someone sits at home and is depressed and they're sitting in the dark in the chair, they just don't see the need to use these medications. That's something that should be assessed and dealt with in our patients, our older patients in particular, because we recognize that there is a greater risk for it. What about allergen immunotherapy? The mechanism, of course, is to shift type 2 to type 1 and improve the, uh, improve the uh, regulatory component. It will decrease total and allergen-specific IgE and possibly increase the production of allergen-specific IgD4. Long-standing argument of whether this has anything to do with the efficacy of modern allergen immunotherapy. There are uh, uh, adherents and there are detractors. You can make up your own mind. Historically, however, age has been considered to be a relative contraindication to allergen immunotherapy with this belief that respiratory symptoms and error in elderly are rarely IgE mediated, even if the history suggests that they could be. The belief then that the elderly immune system is incapable of change uh, associated with immunotherapy's efficacy, that the my immune system is so brittle that allergy shots won't help me or the concern that increased mortality risk in elderly from systemic reaction. 
due to comorbidities or specific pharmacy, polypharmacy, if they're taking an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, an SSRI, et cetera. And I think these are all reasonable things in the decision that we use to, to recommend immunotherapy to our older patients versus not. But to a priori say, well, you're over 65, I would never discuss with you an allergy shot, I think is, is short selling some of our patients in terms of a therapeutic direction that could be of use to them. The evidence for efficacy in elderly is sparse, but even less evidence for lack of efficacy. So I don't know how you do, but if it's somebody who's 12 or if it's somebody who is 80 and I make the clinical decision to put them on allergen immunotherapy, they get a year's worth of treatment, assuming that they get from, from the beginning up to maintenance in a reasonable period of time and they have a chance to see. And I look with them for evidence of improvement may not be 100% improvement, not even be substantial improvement. But if in fact, they come back to me and say, doctor, I don't really, I'm not really any different now than I was when I started a year ago, then they are considered a treatment failure and we stop. That's more common in the elderly population that we put on immunotherapy, even when we're selective about who we put on therapy, than it is in someone who's 12 or 15 years of age. It still, though, doesn't immediately say that they should not have a right to that consideration in your mindset and in shared decision-making fashion, be involved in the ultimate decision that is the risk and, uh, uh, either of lack of responsiveness or of adverse effect worth the potential benefit. And that's a decision that should be made together with your patient, whether they are 12 or whether they are 102. Uh, asthma in the elderly from an epidemiology standpoint, it's similar to younger groups. The A2P depends on whether it's early onset versus late onset. If someone's developing asthma at 60, as opposed to someone that's had asthma since they were a kid, and they're now 68 or 70, there's more likely to be an atopic component here. Their symptoms are likely to be more prominent. There's more likely pulmonary impairment though the decline in the FEV1 is accentuated in late onset asthma, more so even than earlier onset, and the reversibility is usually there, but oftentimes more reversible in late onset asthma and allergic, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, airway hyperresponsiveness is typically there as well. It is underreported and underdiagnosed in the elderly. There is a higher morbidity and mortality, and it's often confused with COPD even in the absence of smoking history. If you have obstructive airway disease and you're 70, it does not a priori mean you just have COPD. Even with evidence of reversibility, is this COPD with reversibility? Is this asthma with irreversibility? The overlap is more prevalent in this age group than perhaps any other one. So obstructive airway disease does need to be taken care of, whether how you're gonna go about doing it is very much important in assessing them in the older population for the asthma component. Again, there are two, uh, two major types, the early onset, continuing the senior years or new onset after age of 65. Immune senescence, the regulatory and new antigen deficiencies, the resulting in a inflammatory environment that's higher. It's actually been referred to in the literature as inflammaging, which I think is hysterical, but uh, 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 it is that is in the literature, and some of your patients that see this on the internet may actually come and discuss it with you. The atopic component is indeed much less, but it's not zero. It's about half. 50% of younger population will have an atopic component, about 25% of older adults. And this is not just people from 65 to 68. This is older adults, 65 and older. And in the there are groups that study what they call old, old people that are 80, 80 and above, this seems to be relatively stable even in the older population. History, history, history becomes very important to assess that. And it's more likely to be perennials in the older population than in the younger population. Dyspnea is typically the most common presenting symptoms. It's not cough, it's not wheeze, it's dyspnea. Half of them report retrospective breathing difficulty years or even decades before that they just sort of 
ignored or, or did not deal with, or their healthcare provider did not deal with. Bronchiectasis is associated with more severe asthma, and you can say it both ways. More severe asthma is associated with increased level of bronchiectasis. They have, not surprisingly, more hospitalization reg and more likely to progress to chronic respiratory failure. High air pollution is associated with ED visits for asthma exacerbations. And this is sort of a nice little cartoon it talks about the severity, whether it's due to the directly the effect of aging or the effect of their asthma. Aging alveolar spaces get larger, elastic recall goes down. This is just happens in everybody, whether they uh, have asthma or whether they don't. Decreased compliance of the chest wall and spine, so they get it's harder to take a deep breath. Premature airway closure and increased air trapping again naturally happens because of this decreased compliance in the airway. A decreased elastic recoil pressure, increased airway inflammation, increased airway remodeling effect of asthma, add all this together and it produces more severe difficult to manage and, uh, uh, asthma in the older uh, population. Pathophysiology from the innate standpoint, uh, eosinophils, increased peripheral eosinophilia and AHR in men. Uh, this came out of the normative aging study. Decreased granulation of peripheral eosinophils in older patients with asthma. It's as though their eosinophils need more to get activated. There's higher increase in neutrophil and neutrophil elastase activity in patients without asthma. Increased sputum in older versus younger patients with asthma. Neutrophils in sputum is more likely in older individuals than younger, uh, reflecting the less allergic component of it. Uh, increased levels of sputum neutrophil mediators in older patients, specifically IL-8 and MMMP9 MMP and neutrophil elastase. Uh, in adaptive immunity, decrease in peripheral Tregs in older patients versus age control subjects, decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines with aging, this uh, inflammaging, I said decreased, I'm sorry, increased pro-inflammatory cytokines, this inflammaging thing. And then a decreased antibody response to vaccines. It doesn't mean we shouldn't vaccinate older individuals, but it might mean that they need a different level of antigen. Think about all the older individuals, the flu vaccine that we give now to older folks, and even the new uh, shingles vaccine that is manufactured specifically with older individuals in mind. Diagnosis, common diagnostic criteria in the elderly. Clinical presentation, again, dyspnea, sometimes cough, uh, may be productive, may not be. It's more subtle because it's oftentimes chronic, and it can be either continuous or relapsing versus new onset. These are important things to assess in your initial workup of your patient. Uh, again, with co uh, comorbidities, it can confuse the diagnosis. One of the big ones is congestive heart failure with cardiac asthma, which is why it's so important to listen, uh, particularly in older individuals, to their naked skin, not over three layers of clothes, to their bases of their lungs looking for crackles, to do a heart exam and listen for extra heart sounds, S3 and S4. Uh, uh, these are important considerations because cardiac asthma can sometimes create the same exact symptom complex as regular obstructive pulmonary asthma, and the outcomes can be quite different. Uh, diabetes and renal insufficiency that can affect uh, other components as well that can confuse the diagnosis. Concomitant smoke exposure, whether it's uh, primary versus secondary, does this patient in fact have COPD with mild reversibility versus an overlap versus asthma uh, that they don't have a lot with a, with a non-reversible uh, component? That, of course, is impo important for the therapeutic approach that you make and how many different controllers in, end up being put on. Diagnostic complications, there's, again, typical prejudice to move to COPD even without a strong smoking history. Lack of initial reversibility does not always indicate irreversibility. You, you give these older patients the same benefit of the doubt that you would give someone who is 30. If you saw someone who was obstructed and was 30 and they denied a smoking history and their obstruction was irreversible in the office, would you immediately assume they had COPD? 
of course, you would not. Likewise, if there's 70, you should not immediately assume that either. Concerns about systemic steroid treatment and repeat spirometry to establish reversibility. Some people would be loath to do this because of the potential side effect, particularly if the older patient had comorbidities like diabetes or uh, a history of malignancies, uh, et cetera. But sometimes a short steroid burst might be very useful to help you establish the level of reversibility and it becomes a uh, a benefit versus risk uh, decision for you with individual patients. Mental status, uh, older individuals do have higher rates of anxiety and depression, which can certainly impact on their disease perception and severity. They can underperceive or overperceive, and uh, the, that those quartiles are more uh, robust in older patients than they are even in younger patients. Altered sim symptom perception can be uh, chronicity of the illness or can be inactivity. The individual is just sitting around not doing much, so uh, whether they're having obstructive lung disease, whether or not, is not as important because they don't have any activity. Other comorbidity, again, can result in uh, physical deconditioning, which can, can uh, convert over to increased dyspnea, remembering back the comment that that's the most common presenting symptoms. Also, uh, interstitial lung disease increases with age, uh, particularly in people of color that may have things like sarcoidosis going on as well. Uh, th those are things uh, for consideration in these older individuals as you do their workup. Diagnostic workup, again, history can be inaccurate due to recall bias and or reluctance for candor. Therein is a the value of having a patient referred to you that has an existing medical history or uh, bringing a relative to their uh, that knows them, that's been around them and knows them uh, to their clinic visit uh, to help them with uh, recall bias. A exam, uh, it's very important to list both negatives and positives. Uh, and the lung exam may appear initially normal, but this these patients, it's important to remove the barrier of clothing so that you can get a good solid skin to stethoscope, uh, listen to these folks and uh, be able to hear subtle sounds that you might otherwise miss. Pulmonary function spirometry in the office versus complete pulmonary function test. Again, it depends on what your objective is. If you're thinking there are other things that may be going on uh, uh, in, in Medicare in particular, uh, they get a little bit picky about you doing uh, spirometry in the office and then shipping the patient off for full PFT. In some instances, they push back on paying for both of those. You have to make the decision of what is more useful. If you've got someone with moderate, what seems to be moderate disease or less, spirometry may be uh, what you use regularly and you may initially categorize them on the basis of full PFTs. That's something that we will commonly do. Imaging CAT scan versus HRCT, certainly a difference in radiation exposure and for what you're looking for. Uh, many of the pulmonologists would suggest that HRCT is superior for looking such things as bronchiectasis, structural abnormality, and interstitial uh, processes. Um, this is comparison to young, uh, young asthma compared to older. Spirometry tends to be yes, less useful, particularly in frail patients. Uh, there are not a lot of reference standards, but it's certainly something that is uh, standard of care in younger asthma. The bronchodilator response uh, may be less pronounced and less useful in exhaled nit with exhaled nitric oxide, in variable but generally gradable, and could be useful. Uh, pheno uh, 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 might be useful. Again, pheno sort of making a uh, resurrection in its value. And uh, it's its own interesting discussion point as to whether it's useful or not. There's not really any good data to say it's more or less useful in your older patients. So the reason it may be more useful actually is that the means for it, obtaining a, uh, a, a pheno measurement will oftentimes be easier because it's just a sustained breath for a period of time, six to eight seconds in that goal, as opposed to trying to get someone to blow out everything they can blow out in one second. And with that change of intrathoracic pressure, making them a little dizzy and fainting, 
which is something that's not uncommon. And then the less accurate way, if you have them sitting down when you're going to do their spirometry, it may be that that pheno might be more useful in this population. I think that remains to be uh, established with good studies. Bethcholine challenge is less used because of the oftentimes cardiovascular contraindications. Uh, ATP is less common, as we've discussed. The comorbidities are more common, particularly lung and heart. Phenotypes, uh, late onset asthma, long-standing asthma, and ACOS described. Uh, and generally, the sputum is more neutrophilic uh, compared to the younger sputum, which is more eosinophilic. Allergy testing should be considered, again, as the history exists. Lower blood IgE, less skin test responsive. CBD, C with diff can be useful in looking for eosinophils. Total IgE can still be useful. Uh, there's not an age curve there, but since IgE uh, uh, decreases with age, an IgE of 150 in someone in their 70s compared to 150 in someone in their 20s may be uh, more significant. Uh, ACT uh, considerations, again, uh, there are those who think that using the ACT score and, quote, helping the patient invalidates the score. There are others that, that will oftentimes record a native ACT score and then explain or query patients with that and then uh, have a revised ATC score. I've seen it done both ways. We tend to do the second one because if they're intrinsically dysmic and it, it's because they've got some congestive heart failure or they're terribly deconditioned and you ask them that if their dyspnea is exhalational versus inhalational and they tell you I only I can't I can't catch my breath not I'm got too much air inside they sometimes will revise their numbers nighttime awakening again is it their asthma waking it up is it their bladder is it their obstructive sleep apnea are they waking up worried or are they someone that has primary insomnia, which is a problem in uh, uh, aging, aging individual? Uh, bronchodilator uh, abuse from habit, altered perception. Well, doctor, you tell me I'm supposed to use that. They get confused about controller uh, versus uh, reliever. And then the whole issue of vocal cord dysfunction, which happens in older people, just like it does in others, quality of life, can very often be decreased baseline because of their lifestyle uh, that may well have a financial component to it, anxiety, loneliness, and other things such as that. Phenotypes in the, uh, in the elderly persistent from childhood or early adulthood, late onset, overlap, and atopic versus non-atopic. Just a couple of slides here as we finish up, and these are interesting. Uh, th this was a paper published a couple of years ago that looked at epithelial uh, cytokines in individuals uh, that had elderly asthma versus non-elderly, IL-33 and IL-31, IL-31 being a pro-inflammatory cytokine and IL-33 being one of the alarmins. Notice that in elderly asthma compared to non-elderly asthma, and although we're talking about a significant difference in number, notice the elderly asthma here is about a fifth the number, or actually a sixth the number of the non-elderly asthma here. But if you see that, there's the, the mean here is much less in the elderly asthma, and for IL-31, the pro-inflammatory, it's less as well, suggesting that uh, the alarmins may well play a lesser role in elderly asthma than they do in younger asthma. However, uh, the in severity, uh, they, they look at eotaxin 2 and TGF-beta, which uh, in their study were uh, viewed as epithelial cytokines and serious elderly asthma versus non-serious el elderly asthma, which they do define in their paper. And by the way, here's the, the citation if you're interested in reading it. It's a nice read. I thought it was a well-done study. Uh, is substantially higher uh, and very statistically significant in the serious uh, elderly asthma patient compared to the non-serious uh, in terms of severity. Same for TGF-beta. It's less remarkable, but it's still statistically significant. So what about management? Basic principle is the same for all asthma patients. Control inflammation, treat bronchoconstriction, maximize quality of life, and minimize adverse side effect of therapy with an eye to the fact that many of these people have a income that's going to limit the choices that they have. Defining safe and effective management 
again, because of the comorbidity, to make sure that the right disease is being treated because of the recognition of phenotypic heterogeneity. Environmental control issues, uh, this gives you, this in my mind is enough reason to test the individual either by allergy skin test or by in vitro testing, because if they're sensitive, I'm not necessarily interested in putting them on allergy shots, but in helping them with control of their uh, home environment, uh, whether it's getting rid of pets or at least having pets, pets bathe more regularly, uh, or whether it is doing environmental control measures for dust mite or mold. Socioeconomic issues related to fixed income, related to living environment, and then the pharmacotherapeutic issues. Environmental control, allergens versus pollutants, dust mite, cockroach, pet dander, mold, urban pollution during the summertime, so much so that remember that it's worse in the heat of the day. So keeping them outside out of the heat of the day and decreasing their exposures may be very useful. Giving them good counsel about using cleansers, paints, fumes, et cetera, the impact of toxic fumes that may be delayed on their asthma. It may make them cough a little bit more at the time, but it may be pro-inflammatory so that within a day or two days, they have more. So letting them, reminding them about this and letting them know the importance of maybe even modified behaviors, not cleaning your toilet unless there is an open uh, window in the bathroom or having someone else do that or something like that. That's conversation that we should be willing to have with these patients. It's often difficult to maintain good environmental control, expense, physical limitations, commonality of indoor pets. Some of those pets are family to them, and then hygiene issues that can promote all of these problems. Uh, more isolation occurs naturally with aging, physical mobility limitations, uh, support structures, friends and families oftentimes shrink with age, friends die, family become involved with other things and don't visit as often. Outside interests can also wane where they're comfortable just sitting in front of the television or just sitting quietly in the dark. It happens. Physical comorbidities, remember, with kyphosis and sternum convex, convexity, that increases their AP diameter, which uh, can result and typically does result in decreased respiratory muscle strength. So they, it's harder for them to take deep breaths. Airway elasticity diminishes, which reduces their exp expiratory flow. So their ratio naturally decreases. Sedentary lifestyle increased physical decondition uh, is a consideration as well. There's uh, uh, more isolation with aging. I am said that, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the third one is psychological comorbidities. Cognitive abilities can minimize uh, symptom recognition just because they don't realize that they're having problems. They have this paradox of well-being. It's well described in the geriatric literature, high level of life satisfaction with lower health expectation. I don't care that I can't breathe very much. I don't care that I'm short of breath because I'm basically going to sit in the chair, so I'm fine. That's not an uncommon con uh, uh, description that you can get from some of your older patients. Anxiety and depression alter concerns about even addressing the symptoms and disturb sleep, which has an adverse effect on asthma control. Yes, poor asthma control disturbs sleep, but disturbed sleep can mess with asthma control because of the fatigue that results for that in the individual. Pharmacotherapy issues, cost of course, drug drug or drug disease interaction, distaste concern about adding more medications to the regimen, oftentimes because of the cost, and also that it reemphasizes to them that 25 years ago, they didn't take anything, and now they're taking 10 medicines. Uh, that, that has an adverse effect on these folks. Cognitive decline, remembering when to take the right medicine at the right time in the right way. Poor recognition of adverse effects. Yes, oh, I forget that I'm using my inhaler at night and it keeps me awake, but I figure it's just because I can't sleep, not because it's the inhaler. They very often won't see that. You have to remind them of that or inquire of it for them. Physical limitation, coordinating using an MDI or sufficient inspiratory effort for a DPI. So which one do you give in your older patients? And do you actually think about this? 
well, this is someone who has trouble doing a deep inspiration, so I probably don't want to give them a DPI, and they don't seem to be able to court it, so I do an MDI, so maybe what I really need to do is to give, her, give them a nebulizer and to use medications that way. The ability to hold their breath for a sufficient period of time may diminish, and dysphagia associated with pill swallowing is a major issue as well. And then finally, specific Thera pharmacotherapy issues, they may be more susceptible to side effects at regular drug doses. Anticholinergics may be more effective for pure asthma in elderly. So adding in anticholinergics earlier in older asthma patients may be appropriate, and leukotriene modifiers may actually be more useful as well. So if you're a physician, sort of like I am, that learned that you use leukotriene modifiers in kids seasonally, and you use them in people where all else fails, this might be something that you might want to consider earlier in older asthma patients. What about biologics? Study for uh, currently available biologics. Uh, Omelizumab reported to age 75. Mepolizumab reported to age 68. And Dupilumab reported to age 80. The theoretical limitations of possibility for IgE decreasing with age, so would omelizumab be less effective? Eosinophil increase with age, but have less specific activity. Does that have an impact on either uh, uh, mepolizum mepolizumab or venralizumab? And then IL-4 increases with age. Does that suggest then that dupilumab might have an increased efficacy? No clue. Uh, there are not good data to address these, but these are things, again, for us to think about uh, that would enter into our decisions and recommendations for biologics for our patients. This is kind of a, lead, a nice little cartoon from 2019 that looks at the different ones that are available. And what's not on this one is uh, tezapilumab has been recently approved. But this one talks about impact on lung function. The frowny is that it makes it worse in the elderly. Uh, that there's no data, which is this one, which is the majority of them. There's no data there or there's weak evidence uh, to suggest that it might be uh, worthwhile versus not. Exacerbations, it seems like, if anything, uh, that they get worse when they're on omelizumab. Uh, symptoms and quality of life is substantially better uh, as well as a good side effect profile. Not a lot of data on this for others, except for benralizumab, where it's uh, the data suggests the side effect profile is no worse than it is in other individuals. Uh, so this cartoon just gives you an idea of sort of where we are in this. None of these data, if you read this paper here, which is again worth looking at, none of these data are real strong data. They're extracted from clinical trials uh, they've not really been looked at independently as you would do this. And in fact, I would argue with the increasing fraction of older individuals who bring asthma into their later years, it would be worth doing a study like this on a large basis to see uh, if there are one group of biologics versus the other that might be better. So in summary, allergy and asthma in the elderly, the presence is relatively common. The diagnosis can be challenging, but must begin with clinical suspicion. Management can be challenging because of increased side effects, the issues with polypharmacy, and the physical and psychological impairments of the population. Reported morbidity, including emergency department and hospitalization, is lower, but if they get there, their mortality is actually higher. We must address these patients in a fashion that recognizes common as well as unique situations to craft effective, personalized therapeutic program. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Chris, I will give you the I will give you the control back. I think. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. That was very informative. Um, let's open it up for questions to the audience. Um, Dr. Marshall, I had one question. I'm one of the second year fellows at Children's. Um, what's your threshold for evaluating for other causes of asthma and um, sort of the older population? Like I'm just thinking as like a developing picture of eGPA. Um, do you 
put that in the back of your mind if you see someone older with asthma or is it kind of one of those things you wait for it to declare itself? Well, as, as I know you know, EGPA rarely presents with only pulmonary symptoms. There are other associated systemic uh, manifestations, whether it's uh, mild neurologic things. Uh, the, the most common thing I see is a version of foot drop uh, uh, with, uh, associated with EGPA. It's not necessary for the diagnosis, but it's common that there's something else going on. If uh, in assessment in older individuals, because of natural comorbidities, it can actually cloud that a little bit. So I think uh, what what is typical for me anyway, is that I, if someone uh, presents to me at age 72 with new onset asthma, I'm going to be immediately more inclusive in a differential diagnosis than if somebody has moved to Jackson from Kansas City and they've been well cared for by Dr. Miller for 20 years, and but they they were cared for so well that when they moved to Jackson, they waited two years before they came to see me because things started to get worse for them again. That individual, you assess them. There's nothing really seemingly different. We get Dr. Miller's notes from Kansas City, put them back on their appropriate medication. They come right back up to a well-controlled level. Looking for other differentials for that one is going to be less necessary if they're 72, even if they were 42. It's to me the individuals that are either new onset and I begin to ask the question why. Now, I never found anything that suggested that, and you specifically mentioned EGPA, is more common in the elderly with new onset asthma compared to older asthma. But it's very rare to see someone with EGPA who's got a 40 year history of asthma and they're just now getting around to making the diagnosis because the, the, vasculitic component is going to do so much damage to them that they're not going to have a 40 year history of EGPA. There's probably a case report or two in the literature that belies that, but generally speaking, that's the case. Late onset, broader differential or loss of control, even if they have been on therapy and the control is diminishing, those would cause me to expand my differential and relook at their asthma in a different light. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? So coming from a pediatric background myself and working in a pediatric institution and more proof today that adults are not just big kids. There's lots of different things to think about, right? Um, uh, is it like you mentioned earlier about atopic dermatitis and late onset and all that? You know, you, just, you have to think of that like cutaneous T cell uh, lymphoma, right. and uh, so there's all the, the the differential diagnosis expands greatly in the elderly patient, and so um, got to have the radar up and look for other causes too. Absolutely. Okay. And the, the EGPA reminds me of back when we finally started getting good inhaled medications for asthma and we got people off their oral steroids. And um, of course, then there was a little bit of concern about montelukast and causes of uh, short spouse in those days. But as we were getting them on inhaled medicines off their steroids and their disease became present. Um, and so I, I think that was uh, surprising, I guess, or... Um, it was interesting because we, you know, we weren't seeing the pediatric population, but we're getting kind of late onset symptoms with because of a, a covered up diagnosis, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, hopefully that's in the past as so we have better inhaled medicines and biologics. So anyway, all right. Um, well, Dr. Marshall, thanks again for contributing to the conferences online and allergy. A fantastic talk today. We really appreciate you being here and, and um, hope we can see you in the near future again. Good to see you guys. Okay. Have a great weekend. Okay. Thanks. Thanks all. Bye now. Bye.